2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. So I've titled this, The Importance of the Word of God, because that's what the rest of this chapter is showing. Peter spent a great deal teaching us at, at chapter 1, really, how to grow in our Christian values. Remember the seven values we looked at last week? We had moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, love. We had these values that were given to us that we are to try every day of our life to put to practice in our life. And what Peter's going to share here in the rest of the chapter is so very important to us as believers because the whole world looks at these Christian values that we're given and try to live their life by it. I've been a part of many different groups in the secular world helping, helping everyone eats, helping feed the hungry, helping put dinners together for those who don't have any food and, and trying to do what's right and trying to do what's moral and trying to do what's excellent. And every society group in the world wants to practice all these Christian values. Everybody in the world wants them. But they mean absolutely nothing. If the foundation of my life is not the word of God, if the standard of my life is not God's word, then these seven values here that we look so deeply at in the last few weeks mean absolutely nothing. In the end, my flesh will corrupt them and I'll be no different than anybody else. But if the word of God, which Peter's going to stress here, is the foundation of my life, then these values will produce fruit in my life and in your life and will strengthen and solidify my relationship in Christ and yours too. And that's why he gives them in the order that he does. So very important. You think about, you know, if I were to say, what building do you know that was not built on a sturdy foundation? Most people would say the Leaning Tower of Pisa. You know, it's like, it's like that, right? It, they built it so many years ago, and it started to tip as they were building it. And they kept on building it. That's mind-boggling. Do you ever read about that? So the, 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 the guy that was the head architect, as, as it started to tip, and it's tipped 17 degrees, and it goes like another 2% every single year. So at some time, it's going to catch up with itself and go, kaboom. Well, well, to compensate the tip, he just, he just changed the angle of the floor every time. <laughs> so you walk up in it, and you're like, the first floor is tipping this way, but it catches up to the top floor. You're like, That's, you build on the wrong foundation, and in the end, it comes tumbling down. And we see that all through Scripture. And Peter wants to drive that home to the believer's heart. Again, we, we opened up this book of 2 Peter. I talked about how many of the older um, saints that were teachers and leaders of churches rejected 2 Peter to be in the canon of Scripture. And that's because it directly exposes false teaching. If you have to take your stand on your denominationalism, Instead of in Christ, you've probably been falsely taught. You probably have the word of God. It's probably going out there, but it's probably not the foundation of what someone's beginning to teach in that. And Peter wants to drive that home in a very personal way. So uh, in the last part of this letter, he's kind of explaining this to the, to the church here. Um, just about how to rely upon the word of God. And, and as we get into the next few weeks, maybe a month or so, um, we're going to look at the false teachers that are beginning to, to rise up at Peter's time. That's why he's writing this. Peter's, the whole focal point of Second Peter is beware of false teaching. But before he gets into it, he spends some really deep time in showing us how to walk our Christian life. Because if I know how to walk my Christian life and it's based upon the standard of God's word, I'm not going to be led astray by a false teacher. I'm going to know the truth. That truth is going to set me free and I'm going to walk in that truth every day of my life because that's the standard of my life. So Peter's pressing that there. Um, he also understood that false teachers have an easy way to seduce people who don't know the word of God. 
There's a lot in the Christian church today that lean upon experience or emotional experience instead of the word of God. And if you just lean upon emotional experience, you can easily be led astray emotionally. Uh, I did a missions trip in um, Spain one time, and we were there for uh, 10, 21 days. And, And the outreach was for people who were brought in for this big evangelical outreach by a false teacher who was healing people and touching their heads and they were all falling down and getting healed and people in wheelchairs were getting up and walking and it was supposed to be this fantastic great move of God. Well, we went there two weeks after the event and there were broken, shattered lives. Every single person who got some kind of a healing was right back in the pit where they were. And what was there, what was left after that big crusade was dark. It wasn't light. It was false light that brought false security that had people who couldn't walk stand up and walk for about six hours only to break their bones and to find themselves back in the, in the gutter for the next two weeks of their lives. And so very, very important when, when Peter touches on false teaching, he's, he's laying down the foundation for our Christian life. And like, again, these seven values that we saw, very, very important um, that, they're, that the foundation of your life is the word of God. So um, Peter's going to underscore really the dependability, the durability, and the reliability of God's word. What he's going to do in this part of the chapter is contrast the word of God with men, Contrast the word of God with experiences and then contrast the word of God with the world itself. So this is our outline. Number one, we're going to look at men die, but the word of God is active and alive and eternal. Men will die. You follow men. Don't follow men because men die. But the word of God is active, it's alive, and it's eternal. Number two, experiences will fade, but the word of God remains. It's not going anywhere. Experiences fade. If an experience is what's holding you in your Christian life, toss it aside right now and get foundational on the word of God. Let that be solid to you so that you won't be waving by it. And number three, the world will darken every day. It's darkening every day. But the word of God shines. It will never stop illuminating the way for salvation. It will never, for eternity, it will never stop showing Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Trust in him. So Peter lays that out for for all people to see, and it's so very important. So let's look at verse Uh, We're going to look at verses 12 through 15. Peter says, Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to call these things to mind. So what Peter does here um, is he's going to show that men die. He's going to die. But the word of God is active and it's alive and it's eternal. And Peter has three motives in what he's sharing with the church here. The first motive is in verse 12. The motive is obedience to God's word. Literally, Christ's command. He, he says, uh, therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. He says, I will always be ready. It means I will not be negligent in what I've been commanded to do. If you remember, Jesus, after he rose from the dead, he said to Peter, Peter, after you've been converted, strengthen your brethren. Listen, Satan's going to test you, okay? And after you've been converted, strengthen your brethren. And then then he rose from the dead. When he rose from the dead, he said to Peter, now go feed my sheep. You have a job to do. Don't be negligent in what I've called you to do. Feed my sheep. How do I do that, Lord? 
tend my lambs. I will, how? Feed my sheep. Feed them my word. And that's what he shows him here. You know, uh, Peter's saying, I want to be diligent to exercise the grace that God has given me in the discharge of my duties as a minister to you. If God has called someone to teach his word, what's that person's responsibility? To teach the word. Or what if nobody likes it? That's irrelevant. What if he doesn't like it? That's irrelevant. You get up and you press on and do it. How many things I have I have done in my life that God has called me to do that I did not want to do? I learned a lot when I was in the Marines because you learn a chain of command. One of the things I did not want to do or be a part of was the silent drill team. I wanted nothing to do with rifles being tossed with knives on them in any way, shape, or form. And so right away, they walk, oh, Millette, yeah, you're in the silent drill team. <laughs> what? No, not me. No way. I'll be the guy that drops the rifle. No, you won't. And I learned how to do the silent drill team. And then worse for me, I'm just doing what I'm told because I learned to do what I was told. So I did the silent drill team. And then as I'm doing it, I knew one of these guys, the leader of the silent drill team, was ready to retire and move away. And I thought, no, the one thing I would never do is to be the overseer of the silent drill team. No way, shape, or form would I do that. Millette, you're the overseer of the silent drill team. Then I came to know the Lord. And he's like, Millette, you're going to go teach my word. No, not me. I'm not going to teach your word. Pick up that book and go teach my word. And you learn, yes, Lord Jesus. Three, three greatest words you could ever say in your life. Yes, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord Jesus. I am here to do your will, not mine. And most of the time, your will seems to go against mine. And I'm not here to fight with you in that. I'm here to lay down my will. You laid down yours to save my life. That's an amazing thing. So the first thing Peter does was show how important it is to be obedient to God's command. So he's saying, I, I'm trying to constantly remind you of what you already know. You know what you already know? Everybody in this room, you know what you already know? God loves you just as you are. The truth is, you don't like who you are. And so you have this big wrestling match. Well, I hate myself. How could God love me? I know it says he loves me in his word. That is a promise that stands true. God loves you, regardless of how you feel about yourself. And his command is, just that there. Peter's saying, you know, I, I don't want to be negligent. I, I want to always be ready. That's the word that's used for the heavy storms that rise up over the Sea of Galilee. So what Peter's saying here is, I want to see you risen up in Christ. I want to see you awaken to the love of God towards you and not just taking it for granted. I want to see you continually walking in according to God's way. This is what I want to see. I, I want to remind you of this all the time so you're always there hearing this. God loves you just the way you are. Now get up and follow his command. Let his word be the center and foundation of your life. You know, uh, be willing to change as God's love stirs up in you and begins to mold you in a Christ-like fashion. So the first thing you see is, is obedience to Christ's command. The second here is in verse 13. Verse 13, I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by a way of reminder. So the second is to remind you then to do the right thing. When he says to stir you up by way of reminder, means I want to shake you up so that you understand what's right and suitable and I want to remind you to do your part in it. Walk this out. Remember to do what's right. I can forget in a second. Anybody like me? I remember to do what's right. I wake up in the morning, go do what's right. Go out and make breakfast. I'm doing what's right. 
I'm going to do what's right. Then 11 o'clock comes. Oh, what's wrong starts coming in. <laughs> like, okay, back off, wrong. Oh, I'll back off. I'm going to wait till 3 o'clock and get you by surprise. <laughs> like, no, don't even do that. We need to be, we, we have a fellowship of believers. The reason why we come together is the teaching of God's word to grow, to grow in Christ and to encourage one another in this walk called Christianity. It's not a lone ranger walk. You'll never make it. We need each other to encourage each other along the way because it's, it's, it's not an easy walk. And that's just what he's saying here. I want to remind you. It's more like a reminder is like a safeguard always protecting me because God knows that I'm always going to try to move ahead of him and not wait on him. So he is this reminder of going over all the time. That's why at Calvary Chapel, we walk through the Bible verse by verse. And every time we get to a book, we get it over and over and over. But guess what? It's always fresh, isn't it? It's always active. It's always alive. It's always there. And yet, maybe we went through that book five times so far. And yet there's something fresh God has to say in that book to each and every person. And he does it every single time. And Peter's reminding them too, literally, that, that when you hear God's word, that it takes time to learn to apply God's word to your own life. It doesn't happen overnight. You start applying it. And as you're applying it, you begin to watch it bear fruit. And you begin to really appreciate and like and love the fruit it bears. You say, you know what? I don't want to live the old life anymore. I hate the fruit that bears. I want to live this new life that God's promised me. And I take this step by faith and I'm learning now to apply that word to my life. And, and to walk it out each and every day. So, so he's, I'm reminding you to take your eyes off men, keep them on the word of God so that you do what's right. Then in verse 14 and 15, the third motive here, it's all wrapped up in the word diligence. He says, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. He's like, I know I'm going to die soon, and I will also be diligent that at my time of departure, you'll be able to call these things to mind. I'm writing this because I know I don't have much time left on this earth, and you need to know this. And you need to be reminded of this. It's to be kept in front of you at all times. This is the word of God that is given to you for the healing of your soul, for the healing of your mind, for the healing of your body. It's given to you for this and, and for that. So Peter knew that. He was going to die soon. Um, so he's trying to press the church, the, the minds of those in the church with the importance of the word of God in their lives so that they would never forsake it and turn away from it. Listen, church, I say this all the time. So very important. The word of God is the only standard of truth we base our Christian life on. It is the word of God. It is unchanging. Well, men have changed it and turned it in the past. Stop watching garbage TV. You get a good version here. You got the American Standard. You got the King James. I'd like to see somebody try to change that. God's kept it for 2,000 years. It is the Word of God. It is given to you to give you hope that goes beyond this world. Hope that will keep you and sustain you and lead you and direct you. And he shows that very strongly. This is the truth we have. And, the, and the, the readers of Peter's letter here were already established in the word. But remember, they were facing heavy persecution. Families were being murdered in front of mothers. I mean, the, the persecution at that time that Nero sent out was horrible. It was horrible what happened. So they're facing the pressures of persecution. They're facing affliction and pain and suffering. And, and that's the time that false teachers start to move in and start going after the hurting. And, and, and with all the pressure there, there was no guarantee that we're going to always remember the truth of God's word and apply it to their life. So Peter's reminding them of the lessons they've already learned. And what he's saying here in verses 12 through 15, he's saying, listen, don't put your trust in men. Yeah, but the guy's got a Ph.D. piled high and deep. That's all that means. 
<laughs> That's okay. I'm not going to assault any doctors here. Some people went to school for a long time to become a, a person who learns how to hand out prescriptions. I mean, I, that's the way it runs. The Word of God has everything we need to make it through this life. Everything we need. And I'm not against doctors. I've been to many of them in my life many times and taken many medications. But Peter's saying, don't put your trust in men. You know why? Men die but the word of God is active, it's alive, and it's eternal. It will never let you down. It will always lead you to the Lord, always, in every, every situation. That's fact number one. Men die, the word of God is active and alive and eternal. Fact number two, experiences will fade, but the word of God remains. Verse 16 through 18, Peter says this, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance was, that was made uh, to him by the majestic glory, he said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. He said, and we also ourselves heard the utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So the focus of this paragraph here is on the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. He's up on the mountain. He's with Elijah. He's with Moses, Peter, James, and John. They look up. They see Elijah. They see Moses. They're looking at, at Jesus. They're talking to Jesus. And they're like, what is it? They, they hear Peter says, Lord, you know, this is right. Let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And what's God say? Shut up, Peter. <laughs> like, not in those words. But he said, hey, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. That's what God said to Peter. This is the logos. This is the living word of God. Listen to him. Yeah, great experience. Did you ever have a really great experience moved you to do something? I'm so moved spiritually. I'm going to build three tabernacles. And God's like, get your eyes off the experience. That's great. It, it, it stirred you. But let that experience be settled on the foundation of God's word. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Do you ever take some time, grab the book of John sometime? Maybe tonight. Relax. Take 35 minutes. Some of you 36 minutes. I don't know. Whatever, whatever it takes. Just read the red letters. Read what Jesus said. I, used to, I have a bookmark downstairs. I used to read the book of John three chapters a day. You read the whole thing in a week. I did that for a year. Transformed my life. Then I did just red letters only. That transformed my life even more. Because you start reading exactly what he said. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And you'll hear his voice talk to your heart. That's a guarantee. So, so Peter was there when the transfiguration happened. He saw the glory of God. And the importance of this event was that it confirmed Peter's testimony about Jesus Christ. He saw that God became flesh and came down here to die for us, that we might trust in him and be saved and be forgiven of all of our sin. Peter saw the glory of the Son of God. And then heard the father speak. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Peter, listen to him. Listen to this man. So what Peter's saying here is, you know, we were on the holy mountain with him. We heard the voice out of heaven with our very own ears. We couldn't be more sure of what we saw and heard. It was God's glory. It was God's voice. And Peter's saying this is the prophetic word that was confirmed to us. We heard the word of God. Imagine that. You who know, understand the word of God. Do you get it? How'd you like to be back then and hear God speak from heaven? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You just heard the word of God. And Peter's saying, we, it was, yeah, we saw it. But then we heard it. We saw the living word. First, I was really moved by the emotionalism of the event. 
But feelings fade. But I saw his glory. This is God who became flesh to become the savior of my soul. And then I heard the Father speak. That's an amazing truth that Peter holds on to in that. So Peter's using this letter again to refute false teachers because most of the false teachers taught that Jesus was not God and that Jesus would not come back to this earth and bring the kingdom of God back here. There wouldn't be a time of that. And Peter refutes the whole thing by sharing that. You know, uh, in the place of God's promises in his word, the false teachers were using what he says there, cleverly devised fables, and and that robbed the believers of the, the blessed hope of the assurance of the forgiveness of their sins and eternal life with God. You know, I grew up Catholic, and maybe some of you did too, or some denomination. I never had an assurance of my salvation. I didn't have the assurance of it. I understood that, well, maybe if I'm really good and I do what's right and I keep all the sacraments and I do this, I mean, how can you really know that you know that you know that you're saved? How can that be? God says it in his word. And his word gives the assurance. If his word is the foundation of your soul, you will gain from that the absolute assurance of your salvation and eternal life with him. And all of a sudden, the pressures of this world, they just fall aside. You don't even care about them. Oh, my, the world's caving in. I'm going to heaven, baby. (laughs) Let it cave in. Oh, this person's sneaking up. Maybe he's the Antichrist. I don't care. I'm going to heaven for eternity. And that's solidified in my heart. And I walk around with joy in the midst of everything caving in. And and that's what he's trying to show here in a very strong way. When he says cleverly devised fables, it means Jewish fables or man-made mythology. Just myths that manufactured that have no basis uh, in fact at all. In fact, the Greek and Roman uh, cultures, myths abounded in stories, and they always talked about the origin of the gods and their dealings with men. And yet the truth is, all of them are speculations that were devised by satanic and human minds. You know why? Because they only ever produce carnal pleasure in emotional entertainment. Take all, I studied mythology in school. That was one of my subjects. I had Mr. Peck. The guy was a little weird, but I, he was a great teacher. I studied mythology. You know what? It didn't draw me closer to Christ. It will never do that. It just made me look at people dressed cladly. That's what it did. But there's a pressing here. The word of God will draw you to Christ where you realize, number one, you're a sinner that needs salvation. Number two, he's going to save you and offer you forgiveness and eternal life and transform your life. No other myth on earth can do that. Only the word of God can, and only the word of God can. Not like uh, the Mormons' books, the extra books that they have. That won't lead you to salvation. The Jehovah Witness Bible won't lead you to salvation. Worshiping God on Saturday won't lead you to salvation. The word of God will lead you to the assurance of salvation and eternal life with him. And that's what Peter's pressing there in a very, very strong way. What he's saying is stay clear of these things. They're not the true word of God. Don't lean on mad-made substitutes when you have the living word of God giving you direction today. He says, we made known to you the power and coming uh, of his return in this. You know, so we declared, we taught you of his authority over death and sin and of his eminent return. Peter's saying, we told you, we taught you of his miracles, we taught you of his redemption, his unconditional love towards us, and his, the grace that he freely bestows upon us. He's saying, we taught you by the word of God. We showed you, this is the word of God, showing this is the Christ, this is who he is, this is what he's done. And he says, and here we are, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, and we heard his voice speaking. So on that mountain, we were eyewitnesses of more than just a mere man. 
We're eyewitnesses that God became flesh and we heard it, we saw his divine nature. So he's reminding his readers of the transfiguration and what he's doing in doing that is he's affirming some important doctrines of the Christian faith. In sharing this little story, he, number one, he's affirming that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God. And he's proving that his death was not simply an example for us, it was actually an exodus for us. Jesus accomplished a way out of eternal damnation. His death wasn't an example, it was an exodus. It was the parting of the Red Sea. Come through and be with me for eternity. So, so he shows that picture there. So the first you know, affirmation is that Jesus is the Son of God. The second one, he affirms the truth of the Scriptures. Who did he see standing with Jesus? He saw Moses and Elijah. Moses represents all the law, all the, the first five books in the Bible. Elijah represents all the prophets, all the rest of the part of the Bible. You have the whole testament, and they're both pointing at Jesus. And he saw, there it is. There's the Old Testament law and the Old Testament prophets, and they're pointing to Jesus Christ. Every word of the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. Every Old Testament word. And if you study it enough, even the spaces between the words in the Hebrew dialect show this is Christ, the Son of God, that God will become flesh and come here to die and lay down his life for you and I. Spend some time in Isaiah 46 for a while and find out that God is the Savior of your soul. And he proves it. The whole word of God shows that. And that's what Peter's showing here. You know. And then the third thing he affirmed was the reality of God's kingdom. The false teachers were teaching there is no kingdom of God. When you die, you just go into soul sleep. That's it. Yeah, but wake up one day on another planet with somebody else somewhere. Like, no. There is a kingdom of God, and Peter proved that there. You know, it, 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 what he also proved, too, was that in the economy of God's kingdom here in this earth, as we're still alive, both suffering and glory work together for the good of God and for God's glory. If you're a Christian today and you want to serve your Lord, you want to make the word of God the foundation of your life, you better be ready to labor for the glory of God. And you're going to do it through suffering and through glory. Because they work together for God's glory. <laughs> Hebrews tells us that Jesus suffered learning obedience. And you and I are going to suffer in the same way. And that's what Peter shows there. So Jesus made it very clear too that any of his followers, they would have to face suffering. Um, but that suffering would lead them uh, always to God's glory. You know, the, the cross, when willingly carried, always leads to a crown. Never forget that. What does it take to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Well, you got to learn all kinds of scripture. No. What's it take to be a disciple of, oh, I got to go to church all the time, which means that now I got to go to Wednesdays too. Oh, this is my whole week shot. No. What's it mean to be a disciple of Christ? To follow him. Pick up your cross. Pick up your cross. That's the implement of death. Pick it up and carry it. And follow him. And you, and you will be, become a disciple of Jesus Christ. And that's how it's done. You pick up your cross. That which puts you to death. I hate this. Pick it up. Why is it in my life? God put it on your plate. You want to bear your cross? No. Pick it up. Oh, it's so heavy. It's so hard. It's so difficult. Where's my word in your life? Because in my word, you'll find the strength you need to carry it. But outside of my word, you'll never find the strength to carry it. In my word, you'll find the hope to carry it. But outside of my word, you'll never find the hope to carry that cross. But in my word, you'll have the security of the assurance of your salvation and eternity with me. But outside of my word, you'll never have that. 
We pick up his cross and we make the word of God the foundation of our life. And that's, we're called to do that uh, in, in a very, very strong, strong way. In verse 19 through 21, the fact here, the world will get darker and darker and darker, but the word of God will shine. Peter says in verse 19, For we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one owns interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. That's why if you're a born-again believer, your faith is in Jesus Christ, and you're assured of that. That when you hear God's word, it'll pierce your heart. It'll strengthen you. It'll equip you to walk closer with him and to trust him more. Why? It's the more sure word and it's governed by the Holy Spirit of God. And he works his word in our lives. You know, right now he's working in one person right here in this room. He's working in one heart, one specific way. He's working over here in someone's mind. He's working over here in someone's life. The same Holy Spirit taking God's word and ministering it, one to comfort, one to strength, one to endurance. And whatever we need at the time to see us through. And he, and he does that all the time. In verse 19, you know, he says, we have the prophetic word made more sure. You know, it it's, means confirmed. We have this prophetic word made more solidly confirmed. He's given us his word as the stable force of power for us that we might understand the thought behind what God's saying. This is really important. We have the word of God. And I know out there in the world today, and, and even in some of the Christian church, that word's manipulated by pastors to get what they want. And they, they should be shot, as far as I'm concerned. They will be when they stand before God. They're going to face a, a, a judgment day that they're not ready for. But this word of God goes out there. It confirms. It's the power. It's the force behind God so that you might understand what God's saying to you. I don't sit down there in my office and say, oh, Lord, what do you want to say to Donnie specifically? And how do you want to talk to my mom? And what do you want to say to Rich? And what do you want to say to Claudia? I, I, I'm just putting a word together. Led by the Holy Spirit. Put it together. God takes it and says, okay, hear my heart. Can you hear my heart for you? I've been trying to break through to you for a long time. Do you know how much I love you? Do you know how much I love you? I left heaven, I left the throne of heaven to come down here and be born a baby. And I was raised up by this young girl who married this young man. And now I'm 30 years old and I went to the cross, I carried the weight and shame of your sin so you could be set free from the bondage of yourself and your sin. So you could trust me and let me lead your life. And let me wash your heart clean. Saying, do you hear my heart? This is my heart. Some people, they listen to the word of God and they go, oh, all the blood and guts. Uh, I just can't read it anymore. I, I used to read it that way many, many years ago. Now I pick it up and I go, wow, Lord. Your grace is so good. You, are, you gave so much grace to these people. Generation after generation after generation, you love them unconditionally. When they spit at you, they mocked you, they ridiculed you to your face. They condemned your word. And you still love them. And here I am, my own miserable life, and you love me. You love me, Lord. And his word solidifies that in the heart. And it's very important. God has given us his word. He's given us the thought behind it. He's given us the true motive in it for us. Why? That we might wholly trust him and let him change us because he cares for us. 
You have a child, you see your child going down a road that's going to be damaging and destructive, and you love that child enough to say something to him. Don't tell me how to live my life. I'm telling you because I know the road you're going on, and it's going to damage your soul. One day you're going to look back and wish to God you could go back in time and never go down that road again. Don't tell me how to live my life. Doesn't it hurt when someone does that to you? And you know where they're going. And you break down, you weep. Why did Jesus weep? That's why he wept. He looked at Jerusalem who snubbed their face at him. He said, if you only knew, if you only knew what's coming just a few years from now because you rejected me. And he wept for them. Amazing, you know. From this living word, we gain the assurance of God's forgiveness of our sin, which, which had held us back from knowing his unconditional love for us. So what Peter is saying here is, follow on after the word of God. It's been given to us by God that we might learn to trust him and see his heart for us and know that he loves us and he's made a way for us to be with him for eternity. Look at 19 again. He says, to which you may pay attention to, it's a lamp shining in a dark place, he says. You know, this word given to me will direct me towards Jesus Christ, where I can be forgiven, where I can understand that God wants to pour his love upon me if I only pay attention to it. But he says, it can, it's, it's this like a dark place. If we pay attention to it as a lamp shining in a dark place. This term, dark place, little, it means murky swamp. And what Peter's saying here is like, you know, we, we see the world, look out at the world, like we go up to the Ball Mountain uh, dam that's up here, and you walk out on the pinnacle and you see the beauty of God's creation. I go up there sometimes, that's where I go to pray. And sometimes I'm sitting there praying, a bald eagle flies by, and I go, Lord, this is so beautiful. It is so beautiful. And Peter's saying, you know, we look out, we see all that God created, and we see his glory in it. But then we can look at the world and see what man has done with what God has created and what he's doing with it right now. And it's easy to see that this world has become a dark place. We've taken what, we've taken what God has created and made it into a murky swamp. We've taken the love that God has given us one for another. We've taken the love of a husband and a wife and twisted and perverted it. And if you don't agree with it, you're out of order. We've, we've taken what God created and we've mucked it up. And that's what Peter's saying here. And the word of God will teach us that. You know, um, again, verse 19 as to a lamp in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. What he's saying here is, God is light and his word is light. So he came into a dark world and he brought the light of God's love into this world. And because he brought the light of God's love into this world, his coming into the world was the dawning of a brand new day. That's why we can say as born-again Christians, his, his mercies are new when? Every day. Every day. How can we say that? Because it's true. Because he brought the light into the world. That's what the book of John tells us. In the beginning was, was God. And he brought the light and the light came and shined. And, the, and men rejected it. It didn't change what the light was. That's like people that they say they're atheists, you know. I'm an atheist. Okay. <laughs> but I'm a good man. Well, but wait a minute. How do you know what good is and what do you base good off of? If, I, I, know I'm a, whether, I know what's good based on the word of God. If you're an atheist, you don't believe in God, you don't believe in his word. How on earth can you say you're a good man? Because what do you base good off of? Well, laws and rules and regulations are my worldview. Well, that's out of order completely. We see that alive. Why do you think young people today go into schools and shoot them up? Because they go to school and in biology class, they learn evolution and they learn that survival of the fittest. The bully wins. The bully's the winner. That's what you learn in school today. 
You learn, well, survival of the fittest. The, the, the weaklings is dropped off and the, the, the strong survive. Really, then you go into your next period class and you learn anti-bully campaigns. And we got kids in school and their minds are so twisted and warped. They, their worldview is backwards and God's not even a part of it. So they go, you know what? I'm the God of my life. And everybody else, these kids in the school, they're weaklings. So get a gun and blow them away. And that's why they don't think twice about it. And you know what? Here in America, we've indoctrinated them into that. Nobody wants to admit it because no one wants the word of God as the standard and foundation of their life. Not many want that in America today. So he says, you know, God is light. His word is light. Coming into this world, birth a brand new day. And what Peter's saying simply, you'll trust God at his word. That's the son of God, the son of righteousness. That's the grace of God will be planted in your heart. And then what happens, no matter what you face through all the storms and trials of your life, Christ in you, you'll be unmoved. You may crash, you may get hurt. But in your salvation, you have this assurance and you're unmoved. You're solid on that. And in John chapter 14, verse 18 and on, Jesus said, I'm, I'm not going to forsake you like orphans. I will come back to you. He said, in a little while, the world will no longer see me. But you will see me because I live. You will also live. And on that day, you will know that I am in my Father and that you are in me and that I am in you. The person who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father and I too will love him and reveal myself to him. And Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is this that going to happen that you're going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered him and said, If anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. Then my father will love him, and we will go to him and make our home within him. How do you know that you know that you know? You let the word of God become the foundation of your life. Base everything off of it, no matter what the world says. And then you have the basis and promises of his word to prove to you that by faith he's dwelling in my heart. And I can sit here with an absolute assurance from the word of God that Christ dwells in my heart because he says he does. And I can face trials and challenges. I myself, I faced cancer four times in my life. I didn't curl up in a ball and hide under the table. I just walked in and faced it. Why? Because I know who I trust. And if he's going to take me home, home I go. Praise God. And if I'm going to stay here, praise God. I'll stay here. If I stay here scarred, so what? I'm going to be with him for eternity. Doesn't matter to me anymore about all the other stuff in that. And then in verse 20, 20 and 21, he says, But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. What he's saying here in verse 20 is, you know, be considered, suffer it to be so, that this be considered, observed, and made known. What? That anything contained in Scripture, anything, even the thought behind the word cannot be taught correctly without the assistance of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because no prophecy of Scripture is according to man's own impulse. You know what that means? That means when Moses sat down to write the Bible, he wasn't going, hmm, what should I say now? Maybe I'll bring up that story. And Aaron came up and said, no, this happened first. Oh, yeah, you're right. Let me write that down. It's not how it went. They were pressed by the Holy Spirit within them. Stirred. The term actually means to be beaten down to the ground. Which means Moses is saying, I'm going to write and the. And the Holy Spirit's like, no, you're not. <laughs> yes, I'm, I, no, you're not. Okay, what do you want there? 
if or. All right, but if or. That doesn't make any sense. It's okay, it will 3,000 years from now. People will know exactly what I'm talking about. They don't want to know what you're talking about. I hope you never come here to hear me. I've said that many times. I hope you never come and go to go hear Ron. No, no. Come here to hear this word of God because that's what you're going to get. And I hope you hear your father's voice. And I hope that voice you hear is saying, I love you. I died for you. I have a life I want to mold you into. Let me have my way in doing it. I'm not trying to make you religious. I want you to know me. I want you to know how much I love you. I will never let you go. I will never forsake you. Have I proven it over and over? Have I ever? I will never let you go. Let me have my way in your heart. Are you going to hear his voice? That's my prayer. You hear that. So, so Peter's saying, you know, prophets didn't write according to their own human feelings or emotions. They actually were dissolved about how they felt, and they wrote according to what the Holy Spirit pressed upon them. Um, and he said, you know, no, no uh, prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. That means men were called by God. They published the word of God. You could read Hosea sometime and see what he had to write. Read what Micah had to write in chapter 3 or come Wednesday night and hear it again. Because he, he, nobody in their right mind would write that to Israel. Only someone led by the Holy Spirit of God would pen such a word and hand it over to the leaders of Israel. Only someone led by God would do that. And that's what he's showing here. You know, the word of God was written also to common people, not theological professors. You know, so the writers assumed that the common people would read it and understand it and apply it to their lives and that the common people would be led by the same Holy Spirit who inspired the word. So, you know, any humble individual uh, believer can learn about God as he reads and meditates on God's word. Nobody needs an expert to go tell them the truth. And we sit here today because God raised up pastors and teachers. And that's for the purpose of training you onto maturity with the word of God. So in, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, says, And truly he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. God wants every one of us to be brought on to the fullness of our faith in Christ. And he knows that it's not going to happen at home alone. So he raised up fellowships of people where he would raise up leaders or overseers who would teach his word. And, and for what? For the people to be raised up to, to do the work of the, he says here. And until this, so that we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ. Why? So we're no longer infants tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine and the dishonesty of men and the cunning craftiness and wiles of deceit, but that you, speaking the truth in love, may in all things grow up to him whose head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitted together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working and the measure of each part, producing growth in the body to the edifying of itself in love. I teach the word of God. That's what God called me to do. I teach it to you. That you might take that word and apply it to your life. Why? That you might mature in your faith in Christ and help others do the same. That's sometimes people come up to me and they go, we really need this ministry in the church. And I'm like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, that's really nice. Yeah. So what did you say? You, what did you say you were going to do? Uh, well, we really need this ministry in the church. Okay. <laughs> Don't look at me. I got enough on my plate. Maybe you're stirred about something. Maybe you think this should happen. A lot of people say we, 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 we. Whoa, 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 whoa. Who's we, 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 we? You, 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 me, 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 me. No, 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 no. <laughs> we got enough on my plate. I'm, do, I'm pastoring and teaching you the word of God. And if you're stirred, 
hey, we need to do this. That's really great. Let's pray about that. No, let's go do it. Great idea. <laughs> Have at it, brother. Do it. You know, it's, it's just what it is. We're all taught to grow in Christ. And Peter's pressing here is so very important. On the word of God. Is the word of God the foundation of your soul? If it is, guess what? We, we've looked at these seven Christian values, moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brother love, and kindness. If we don't have the word of God as our secure foundation, then all the practice in the world of these seven values will never amount to anything, only worldly stuff. And then as I'm working out these values in my worldly way, in the end, my own nature will corrupt it. But if I allow the word of God to be the foundation of my life, the only standard I'm going to live my life by, then these seven values stand as the security of my whole Christian life. <coughs> and in them, I find the truths of my security in Christ. And you know something? That's something God can build on. That's how God builds on a firm foundation. I let the word of God be that foundation. And I let my Christian life be built off of that. And God takes it exactly where he wants it to go. And Peter lays that down. We spent probably three weeks on that. But so very important because that's the foundation. Now he's going to introduce false teaching. And what he doesn't want is people to be taken captive by the false teaching. Because false teachings really heavy in our world today. And we're going to cover it in the next, next month or so. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time that you've given us to spend in your word. Lord, I ask that you take your word that was taught today. Plant it deep in every heart. Let it be watered by your Holy Spirit. Let it produce fruit for your glory, Lord. Don't let the enemy take it away. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.